it's me, Anthony. So today I'm going to analyze a film that holds a truly ironic title. I'm of course talking about the 1998 film, Happiness, written and directed by Todd Salons. Happiness explores the harsh reality of finding true happiness within yourself. As you may or may not already know, the film focuses on a series of intriguing people linked through three sisters, and their individual pursuits of, well, happiness. Even the film's theme song makes a note of this. Happiness, where are you? It's pretty safe to say that the main characters in the film are anything but happy, and we as the audience get to experience this firsthand for bizarre, entertaining, and even somewhat disturbing sequences. You may be asking yourself, why is one of the central characters a pedophile? Are we meant to empathize with this sick bastard? Well, not entirely, but as we've already established, the film focuses on the desire of happiness, and unfortunately for some people, happiness is found within molesting young children. Now, the film doesn't urge you to find this appealing or even relatable. After all, the character does get his eventual comeuppings. What the film tries to communicate is the fact that some people simply can't reach happiness in a normal manner. All of the characters achieve, or at least look for happiness, through despicable or just straight up shameful acts. I also think it's important to mention that because the film features something, it does not necessarily condone it. Dad, did, did you, um, uh, w with Johnny Grasso and Ronald Farber? Yes. As we've already established, the film explores a handful of controversial topics whilst linking them to the idea of happiness, and at the same time providing social commentary throughout. The character of Bill is a prime example of Todd Salons exposing a taboo subject and effectively making the audience understand the character's aims, despite the morbid absurdity of them. The use of an enchanting soundtrack accompanied by a bright colour scheme and dreamlike cinematography signifies the attraction Bill develops for the young Johnny. The positive vibes created by the elusive visuals contrasted by Bill's shameful facial expression and shown through tight framing essentially sums up the whole situation as well as Bill's internal conflict. In fact, the entire tone is reminiscent of an adolescent type of attraction. Except, it's between a grown man and a young boy. In addition to all this, the actual composition of the shot foreshadows Bill's eventual imprisonment, with the wire fence representing a prison field, or simply cell bars holding Bill back from engaging in further acts of pedophilia. The fact he finds happiness for engaging in sexual activity with children is sickening, yet it's shown in such a way that puts things in a whole new perspective in comparison to an adolescent type of attraction. I'm going to stress once more that the film does not promote this type of behaviour, it just provides you with another perspective from the mind of a pedophile. Much like American Psycho or A Clockwork Orange showcase a point of view from the mind of a psychopath. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to a different character. Alan, played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, who could just blandly be described as a pervert or a creep, actually brings a lot more to the film than you'd expect. His awkwardly shy persona, consistent self-loving nature, and a lack of relations immediately proves that he isn't comfortable in his own skin or in this society. What can I talk about? I have nothing to talk about. I'm born. I know. I've been told before, so don't tell me it's not true, because it's a fact. I bore people. People look at me and they get bored. People listen to me and they zone out bored. Who is that boring person, they think? I've never before met anyone so boring. For her to see how boring I am, 
gallon of skim milk, a dozen eggs, and one of those disposable cameras for the weekend. Even his own psychiatrist, who happens to be Bill, glaringly ignores his existence. Alan's apparent issues and insecurities obviously contrast with his way of finding happiness, which happens to be lost. His sexual frustration, as well as his desire to engage in sexual relations with his attractive neighbour, is explored in a more blatant manner. Salons essentially exploits Alan's private life, and he does so in a very unapologetic way. A variety of close-up shots seem to be incorporated quite often with this character, which emphasises on his somewhat selfish needs, as well as the close identity he seems to adapt, ironically contradicting his desire to interact with a female. The fact his other neighbour, Christina, develops an attraction to Alan which he initially dismisses, proves that he isn't looking for a long-term relationship, as well as further reinforcing his archetypal loss for perfect women. What the fuck are you doing here? Get out! Get out! Get out! There isn't much else to say about Alan in terms of his character. He later develops a more heartfelt relationship with Christina, despite leaving her as a second option. Maybe the character of Alan is Todd Solons' way of showcasing the outcome of a social outcast. Alan seems like the type of guy who was completely dismissed and probably bullied during his time in school, and thus making him dismissive of the ones around him. His simplistic apartment with a few postcards on the wall proves that he really is lonely. His friends, if he had any, have clearly moved on to better lives, while he's stuck all by himself in his simple apartment. The fact he plasters one of the postcards to the wall using his own sperm either indicates a loss of connection with one of his friends, or a long-lost relative he no longer cares about. You think I'm shit? Well, you're wrong. Because I'm champagne. And you're shit. Until the day you die. The last character I'm going to take a look at is Joy, appropriately named as her personality is essentially full of positivity. As a result of this, the only negative decision she makes, being the rejection of her lover, immediately sends her into an unavoidable downward spiral. This joyful and seemingly innocent character is both metaphorically and literally beaten over the head countless times throughout the film, which begs the question, what did she do to deserve this? Apart from the fact she broke someone's heart, which wasn't necessarily a selfish action, especially if the relationship is going nowhere. The simple answer is, she didn't really do anything to deserve this. I believe Joy serves as a representation of any hardworking and genuine human being. No matter how hard she tries, she will always end up in pain or simply at the bottom, in her family's eyes or even in the eyes of strangers. When the stranger does give Joy the attention and affection she seeks, she clearly lights up once again with a glimmer of hope. Although, when asked about her well-being, she immediately goes into a state of denial. Hello, bud, how are you? I am fine, how are you? Oh, fine, fine. I don't believe you. Really, bud, I'm fine. I'm sorry, I'm just a terrible teacher. And everyone hates me, and I really should have never left telephone sales because I was really doing a lot more good then. Where do you want to go now? Oh, I'm just on my way home. Uh, tell me where do you live? I take you home. Oh no, I couldn't. Joy, come in my car. I won't give you a ride. Vlad, no, I like walking and the train is right nearby. No, no train, I drive you home. Vlad, I live in New Jersey. Good, I take you New Jersey. No, maybe you don't understand. New Jersey is far. Joy, you not understand. Huh? I drive her, my taxi. You come. You understand? You come. Are you sure you know? Vlad, no. The repetition of fine proves that she isn't selfish and doesn't want people to worry. Apologizing for essentially nothing shows how vulnerable she really is in this society, and initially rejecting Vlad's offer shows that she doesn't want to take advantage of other people. 
As you can see, these simple few snippets of dialogue showcase Joy's true character, and thus represent how unfortunate someone can be despite maintaining a positive attitude. It's common to see good people get treated badly, life is unfair, and Todd Solans doesn't shy away from that. He takes the brutally honest route of the events that surround the misfortunate Joy. She's the sensitive one, the innocent and naive juvenile, the inevitable disappointment within the family, despite being the hardest working person out of the family. She avoids taking advantage of other people and attempts to live a very selfless life. Yet, her idea of happiness stems from pleasing other people, which of course results in those people taking advantage of her. In summary, Joy's seemingly harmless pursuit of happiness unintentionally causes more harm than good, which shows that even when you think you're doing everything you can to achieve success, you can still end up miserable. Joy? Are, are you okay? Yeah, sure. I'm fine. I chose to analyze these three specific characters as they stood out the most to me. They communicated the film's themes most effectively, whilst having their own individual personalities, and thus providing short character studies on people simply looking for happiness. After my second viewing, Happiness quickly became one of my favorite films of all time. It is a truly profound film which provides some really valuable social commentary, as well as some shock value. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Thank you for watching!